take a look at Psalm 25. That's our call to worship today. I'm not really sure which one of these I want to read. There's so many, um, so many things here, so many verses that we could read for a prayer this morning. And perhaps maybe verses 15 and 16, my eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn thee unto me and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Oh, bring me out of my distresses. Let's stand to our feet this morning and we'll begin with a word of prayer. Father, I could say with David, turn thee unto me, but moreover I would say, turn me unto thee. Have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon us today, Father. The troubles of our heart are enlarged or bring us out of distresses. Lord, be close to us today. Be near us as we worship you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. your way to Hebrews chapter 9 also as you're making your way to the we'll read today uh, just to start verses 14 and 15 Colson has uh, verse 14 up on the screen now so if you look there in verse 14 we'll begin there today how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise 
of eternal inheritance. Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we thank you for this word. Help us now, Lord, as we break this bread and as we uh, consider all that you have for us here in Hebrews chapter 9, that you would speak to our hearts. Give me unction today, Father, as I preach. Lord, watch over us that you would guide us, that we might walk in your way, Father, the ways of the Lord. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So who is Jesus? Well, this one's uh, pretty easy, isn't it? There in verse 15, he is the mediator of the New Testament. So we're going to talk about that today. Uh, we've been in the book of Hebrews, been answering the question, who is Jesus? Most of the sermons, I, I've departed from that just a little bit there in chapter 6. But today we're going to look at this idea of him being the mediator of the New Testament the writer of the book of Hebrews is very, very intentional about presenting Jesus and all of his glory as the Son of God, as the high priest, and after the order of Melchizedek, greater than the first tabernacle, greater than all the high priests that ever came before. Um, he, is, he is that wonderful and greater than the angels and Moses and Aaron and all the rest. Um, so, and of course, now we come to chapter 9. Have you ever needed one of those books? Um, I, I don't know what they, I, it, they're called. You know, something for dummies, like like computers for dummies. You ever you ever bought one of those? So back when I was in seminary, in college, there were no such thing as personal computers. And so everything had to be typed. And either I had to type it or I had to pay for somebody to type it. And usually I tried to type, and I was a horrible typist. I hated typing. Hated, hated typing. And they, the professors at college would not accept a handwritten paper, you know. It had to be typed and formatted and all the rest. I despised that. When the personal computer came out, I fell in love with writing on a computer because you could go back and correct without the tape or the or the juice or you know all of that stuff you could fix it and I never could fix my errors and I had so many errors when I would type and I always thought it was interesting I, I couldn't do it my father one of the things that he did when I was a boy was he was a typewriter repairman or at least he sold the service of the typewriter repair shop and, uh, and we had typewriters all around our house all the time. When I went to college, I had a nice uh, Corona typewriter, and it was an electric one. And I just hated that I couldn't write on it. But when the computer came out, I was good. I was golden. I could write all day. Compose on it, correct it, you know, all, all the things that you can do in a word processor with a computer. When Windows came out, I was in college, and I'll never forget the the uproar, I was in seminary, and I'll forget the uproar amongst the students, uh, because so many of them were going to lose their ability to, to use the keystrokes that they were so used to, because the mouse had come out with the Windows system. And I remember going to the store and seeing a book called Computers for Dummies, and I bought that book because I needed to know, I didn't need to know all the, all the details right there's lots of details with the computer lots of details i just needed to know sort of the basics i needed a simple outline of what it meant to use a windows machine so that i could you know i could jump into it then and and be at least proficient with it well this week i'm reading through chapter 9 the book of hebrews and i thought about that experience and i thought you know what i need i need hebrews chapter 9 for dummies so I, I, need a, I, I need some kind of a simple framework that would help me navigate this chapter because there's so much here. This, again, is like my Aunt Virgie's Mississippi mud cake. You know, you take little bites, and there's so much in each bite. You can't eat a whole piece of the Mississippi mud cake. You just, you just sip on it. You know, you take little bits every now and then because it's so rich. Hebrews 9 is like that. It's so rich. So I made myself a Hebrews 9 for, for dummies. 
I grafted out for myself. Usually I don't come to the pulpit with drawings, but I have today because I needed something so that I could understand it, so that I could help you guys understand it. Now, maybe you've already got this one uh, locked away. This one for me was, was tough. And so I wanted to come here and try to demystify this particular chapter. And so let me, let me begin by just reviewing, or not really reviewing, but, but helping us through his overview. He, the writer here in chapter 9, beginning in verse 1 and going through verse 6, he gives us an overview of the tabernacle. So let's just look there real quick. The first six verses. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the t and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called holiest of all, which had the golden censer, the ark of the covenant, overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. I'm sorry, I, I said six. I meant to say down through seven. So you've got this overview of what was the tabernacle. And, and we have here a, a great deal of it. We have the uh, sanctuary itself, and what's inside it. So there are two rooms inside the tabernacle. The first one is called the sanctuary or the holy place. And in that room you had the table of the showbread and all that he mentions there, the candlestick. And then behind the second veil, you had the ark. And he mentions that. This is the holiest of holies, the holiest of all, he calls it. And there you had the ark. And you had inside the ark the pot with the manna and the Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And on top of the ark was the mercy seat, and you had the cherubims, and they had their wings spread out over the top of the ark. Now, he says here, we cannot speak particularly, and it's because the, the, the details of what exactly that looked like, all we have is what is written for us in Exodus chapters 25 through 30. It tells about the creation of the ark and all of the tabernacle, actually. So we have that picture, but what it really looked like, no one can say particularly because only the high priest had ever seen it. So he says we can't speak about it in particular terms. And also because this is perhaps written after the destruction of the temple and all that now is gone. It's been destroyed or carried off, maybe cut up into pieces so they could have the gold. So it's, it's, he's speaking about something now in the past. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went in always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. So that first tabernacle where the showbread was and the, and the candlestick was, they were going in there every day. And they're putting on the showbread fresh every day. That's the, that represented the word of God. And the candlestick represents the light of the Holy Ghost. And so they're working in there every day. And then at the very back of that room, there's the the uh, incense, the offerings, um, the, uh, the altar of incense, and they're, they're making offerings there on that incense altar, and that represents the prayers of the saints. And that altar is right before the veil that goes into the holy place. Now, he mentions that in the second is the, is the altar of incense. So he must connect the altar of incense and the veil of the holiest place of all with that area. So that's okay. Um, so we have this overview that he gives. And then he says, the high priest comes in here, verse 7. The high priest comes in here every year. Notice it says that. Alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people. So you've got the priests working in the first room where the table and the candlestick and the the uh, incense altar are. And then you've got the, the high priest who goes into the holiest place once a year 
where he offers for himself and for the people the blood that's been sacrificed on the altar outside. So, so and this, the holy place represents heaven. So the priest goes in there and he, there's the mercy seat. We've talked about that. You know, we have now access to that throne of grace. That mercy seat represents the throne of grace. Blood has been placed on that mercy seat. Forgiveness of sins has been accomplished, but it was accomplished every single year. And he did it for the people every year. And not only for the people, but for himself. So he gives us this beautiful overview of the tabernacle and the high priest's role and the priests and what they're doing and all the different furnishings that are there. So he gives us this lovely little, uh, uh, really a review. Because remember, who the writer of the Hebrews is, is writing to. He's writing to people who are Jewish, who understand this, and they're close to the time when this was happening, so they have a memory. They have a memory of all of these things and how they were done. And, of course, maybe some of them are priests themselves who have you know, been born again. They believed in Jesus, and so they're probably nodding themselves, yep, that's right, yep, that's right. And so he's writing to a folk who know that, and he makes, this, he makes this a little overview, setting us up for what he's going to say later in the chapter. Now, I want you to skip down with me to verses 18 through 23. He mentions there in 7 how the high priest brings blood. And that blood is for his sins and for the sins of the people. And he makes that offering on the mercy seat with that blood. Look at uh, 18 through 23 with me. Here's the importance of blood. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and goats with water, sprinkled, uh, I'm sorry, with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. And almost all things are by law sprinkled with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So you see, God had ordained that blood was used to sanctify all of it. And it, that goes from the book of the covenant that God had made with Israel, to the people, to the tabernacle, to all the instruments of service, and the priests. They too were sprinkled. And so blood was shed, water was added, hyssop with scarlet wool was dipped into that mixture, and everyone was sprinkled with that, sanctifying them for this covenant that God made with Israel and setting apart the tabernacle, all the instruments, the priests who would work there, everything was sanctified with blood. And the writer of the book of Hebrews says very clearly, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. So, all of these things are sanctified. Why is that? Why do you need that to happen? Because remember, you have humans who are handling all of these items. And so our disgrace and our great corruption no matter what we do, no matter where we go, it taints everything that we touch. And so these things had to be set apart and sanctified because we're handling them. The, the priests are handling them. The high priests are handling them. Blood had to be shed so that these things could be purified and set apart for God's service. See, now that's very important. We'll come back to that in just a minute. So you have the importance of blood outlined here for us by the things that are spoken of in Exodus uh, chapters 25 through 30. You have the creation of the tabernacle 30 on. You have the sanctification of all of that plus the people. And then, of course, then in Leviticus you have it as well. God designated blood to be used to sanctify all of these things, set them apart. But then I want you to notice, and I'm going to jerk you around here just a little bit. Go back to verse 8. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8. Uh, where am I? Here we go. 
This comes in after verse 7. Verse 7, the high priest had gone in once every year with blood, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Listen to these words, verse 8. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats, drinks, divers' washings, carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Did you, no you notice what he says there in verse 8? The Holy Ghost thus signifying. The Holy Spirit himself is saying, all of these things are happening during this time of the tabernacle, but guess what? It doesn't, it doesn't eternally and finally do something for the worshiper. It's only temporary. If it were not, if it were not temporary, then the high priest could go in once, and that's all, and take care of all of it. But he has to go in yearly for himself and for the people. So the Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Brethren, we have entrance into the holy place of all. That veil has been torn. And no longer does it say on the outside, high priest only, once a year only, with blood only. Because our high priest, Jesus, has gone in with his blood, not into a tabernacle made with hands, but he's gone into the one in heaven and offered his blood there. And that earthly veil was torn in two, signifying that the way is now made perfect and that everyone now can come by Jesus and by his blood. So the Holy Ghost signifies. He tells us, it's not yet done. So when's it going to be done? And I'm sure that's the question that many, many of those folks had asked themselves all down through those generations. Every high priest, maybe every priest in the order of Aaron, in the order of Levi, they were wondering, when are we going to be done? When is the Messiah going to come? When is all this going to be no longer a shadow, but real? Because all of this is shadow. Moses made the tabernacle and all the instruments and the priesthood and the priest's garments and everything by a pattern that he saw in the mountain. God showed it to him and said, you make sure you make everything according to this pattern. And he did. But it's just a shadow. It's a type. It figures Christ. But they made it into something that was less than that. But now here comes Jesus, and what is he going to do? Well, notice verses 11 and 12. Here we have, as I like to often say, the golden adversative. We have verses 1 through 7, which tell us about the tabernacle and all that transpired there. Verses 8 through 10, which is the Holy Ghost warning. It's not yet done. And now we have verse 11. But Christ, how wonderful. What a grand adversative here. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So now you see that the blood of Christ is the thing that enforces the New Testament, and it was prefigured by the blood of bulls and goats, which could never do it, but somehow they knew blood was involved. And now here comes Christ after the pattern, and he gives his blood, and he takes that blood, and he goes into the heavenly tabernacle, and he offers his blood on that mercy seat, and it purchases a way for us to come to God, purchases our redemption from sin, and ladies and gentlemen, purges our conscience from the guilt of our transgressions and allows us to serve Christ. Let me just do a little, um, 
just a little bit about the blood of bulls and goats and the blood of Christ, just as a comparison. Because Christ is a high priest of good things to come, as it says there in verse 11. He entered a more perfect tabernacle. That is, it's not worldly. It's not of this building. That is, the tabernacle that was or the temple that was. It, it wasn't that. He didn't go into something made by men. It's more perfect than that because it's in heaven. He didn't take the blood of bulls and goats. He took his own blood. He did it once for all. Remember, the high priest went in yearly, one time a year, and did it for the people. Jesus goes in once. At the end of the age, the writer tells us, and does this for us. And it's offered for us. So this is what Jesus does. The blood of bulls and goats, it was effective for the purifying of the flesh. We already talked about that. Moses uh, you know, mentions that, or the writer mentions that about Moses. It was also effective or for dedicating the first covenant because everything was set aside by the sprinkling of blood. It was also, it was also effective for the purification of that sanctuary. So as every, everybody was touching stuff and building stuff and setting it apart and doing all this, blood came in to purify everything. However, the blood of bulls and goats was ineffective to purify the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus was to go, and the blood of bulls and goats was ineffective to purge us from dead works and to purge our conscience from the guilt of sin. Now the blood of Christ... By it, eternal redemption is obtained. Conscience is purged from dead works, there in verse 12. By the blood of Christ, he entered into the holy place in heaven. And isn't that fascinating? The very Son of God, who sacrificed himself, who gave himself for the joy set before him, went to the cross, endured the shame, was raised the third day, when he entered the heavenly tabernacle, he could not go in unless he had his blood with him. The blood of the covenant that Christ sets, ladies and gentlemen, is so much greater than the blood of bulls and goats that Jesus himself had to enter that place with his own blood because that was the only perfect sacrifice that could manage to take care of the redemption and all the rest. He enters the holy place. The blood of Christ, by it, he appears before God for us. There's in verse 24. He puts away sin once, not yearly. And he bears the sins of many. Verse 28 tells us that. So the, so the blood of bulls and goats infer, enforced the first covenant. But the blood of Christ enforces the second covenant, the New Testament. How much greater then? is the blood of Jesus Christ than all the blood shed over those many generations of all those animals that foreshadowed what Jesus would do when he laid down his life on that cross to become the sacrificial lamb of God for us. So much greater. By it, all of these things happened. And then we have, I think, and I, I did this on purpose. I had... Uh, 14 and 15 as our verses for today. I think this is the key passage really here in the book, in this chapter, in, in chapter 9. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Yes, this is a key passage. Because, number one, we, and I think probably number one with a big asterisk and a star beside it and an exclamation point and, and sprinkles and fireworks and balloons and, you know, loud music playing this pleasant this is the thing that he does for us we become able to serve the living God notice that in verse 14 
How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now, we're not talking about the high priest anymore because the high priest was a figure of what Jesus would do. We're talking about the priesthood. Remember up there in, uh, what verse was it? The priests were going into the tabernacle and it says that they went in to serve God. Where was that? The tabernacle, candlesticks, the table, showbread, the sanctuary, the second veil, the golden sense of the ark, uh, the tables of the covenant. Oh, yeah, it's verse 6. There it is. And when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. Guess what you become in Christ Jesus? Well, the, the, the people in, uh, at the throne of God in Revelation chapter 5 tell us. Priests and kings. That's who we are. And why are we priests and kings? Because we are able to serve the living God. Just like these priests served the living God in the tabernacle, but it wasn't perfect and it wasn't complete. And their consciences were not, their consciences were not purged yet from dead works. And from the guilt of sin. Only the blood of Christ can do that. And now we become priests so that we can serve God in this life. When you are here, when you're elsewhere, when you're at the market, when you're at your job, no matter where it is you go, you go as a priest of the Lord God, serving him. You're taking his word, you're taking his light, you're doing it all. You're a traveling tabernacle. And you're serving the Lord in that tabernacle doing all those things that the priests did. How wonderful that is. That is what we've been called to. Now, how do we apply all this? Well, I think I've already kind of touched on some of it. You know, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant so that we might serve the living God and receive the internal inheritance from him. I was just amazed as I went through this chapter at how many of the us and our and we statements there were. Just look at verse 12, for example. In verse 12 it says, Neither by the blood of, bulls and go uh, of, blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into a holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for who? For us. For us. Let those two words ring in your heart for a moment. He did all of this with his own blood for us. It's not for somebody else. It's for all those that the Lord God would call. He has called us to himself. Jesus did this for us. Look at verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God... Purge your conscience from dead works. Who's the your there? We all can raise our hand. I'm the your there. He did that for me. He purged my conscience from dead works. The guilt of sin and transgression, all that. He's taken care of that. And made me now a priest unto God to serve the living God before him? Yes, sir. This is what Jesus has done for us. He has obtained eternal redemption for us. He has purged our conscience from dead works so that we could serve the living God. He has, look at verse 24, appeared. Where am I here? There it is. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figure of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. There it is again. He did this for us. He just didn't do it out of willy-nilly. No, he did it for the joy set before him. Why? Because he knew he was going to bring many sons and daughters to glory by this. He appeared before God in that tabernacle for you, for me. He shed his blood for you, for me. He did this work for us. Oh, let that ring. Let that ring out, ladies and gentlemen. This is what Jesus has done. Verse 15, here we have some doctrine. 
in verse 15. Let me find my place here. For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promised eternal inheritance. Here is election. God has called. He has called to those who he has elect to come and receive eternal redemption or eternal inheritance. And not only really do you have the doctrine of election here in this passage, but you also have the doctrine of limited atonement. Because you have the offering being made by the priests for the people. God called a people out of the world. And those people were in covenant with him. And the sacrifices that were made, they were made for those people, for the Jewish people, those in covenant with him. But everybody else, were the sacrifices made for them? No. Did the high priest go into that veil once a year for everybody around the world? No. He went into that veil once a year with the blood for the people. And so Jesus, when he gives us an eternal inheritance, who is it for? The people. The church. So he has called, those that are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. That's how special you are. God has called you. He has redeemed you. He sent his son to shed his blood for you, to make a way for you into that holy place so that you can appear before the, the throne of grace and receive grace and mercy to help in time of need. He's done this for you, all of it. And then in verse 28, with this I'll close. Church, here is our battle cry right here in verse 28. Verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Are you looking for him the second time? Because he's not coming the second time to die on a cross so he could do it all over again. No, sir. He is coming the second time to take his family home. He's offered once to bear the sins of many. Unto them that look for him. Are you in that company? See, this is what we need to be crying out to the world. Are you in that company? Come. Come for the Spirit calling you. Come. Hear the gospel preached. Come. Receive the good things that Jesus has for you because he is the mediator of the New Testament. And only in him will you find peace. Will, the, only in him will you find a conscience cleared of all the guilt of sin and transgression that keeps you from serving God. Only in him will you find the ability to serve the living God. Only there. Now, Holy Spirit thus testifies that that way is not going to work. It had to be something else, something perfect, something wonderful, something heavenly. And guess what? It came. And it came in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ. Son of God, Son of Man, Son of David. He came and died on a cross so that we could have all of these things for us, ladies and gentlemen, eternal inheritance is available. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for our mediator today. One, one covenant. And we thank you for him and his death and all that he's done for us. We ask, Lord, that you would now bless us as we consider these things. Lord, that you would reach out the hearts of these, those that they're close to, and those who may hear this by audio or video. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak to hearts and draw folk to Christ today. Watch over us now, for we pray in Jesus' name.